Next 10 days in the zombie apocalypse. Out now. Oh, it's a snail. You're French now. Oh my god! <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome to Blue Skies. Two dimensions, ever bright and ever dawn, with its new fantastic fauna and flora. I hope you enjoy. Before entering any of these dimensions, you need to find a specific structure in your world. The gatekeeper's house. It generates in plains, mountains and most snowy biomes. It sometimes consists out of two parts, the small and the bigger building. In the bigger one you will find the gatekeeper, and in the smaller one, one of the two dimension portals. Interact with the gatekeeper itself to acquire the zeal lighter and the blue journal. The lighter lights up the portal and the book will slowly fill up during your journey in these dimensions. Before starting, this mod follows a mechanism that even Between Lens has. If you didn't watch that video, maybe you should check it out. Meaning overworld weapons and tools won't be so effective in this world. Even though I have netherite armor, my armor bar isn't even half filled. Dungeon difficulty. Depending on your difficulty when you summon the boss, the boss itself will be a different ascendant tier. The normal summoning will happen with keys, if you are on easy, bronze or normal silver and on hard gold. This is indicated by the star above the boss health bar. But you can as well resummon the boss. Each of them drop a loot bag, the rarity depends on the difficulty, but it has the chance to give you each time a different arc. This is used to resummon bosses by interacting on the dungeon entrance with the arc on easy silver, normal gold, and on hard platinum. That's also how you can get different tier trophies. As well, if you don't defeat the dungeons in the right order, you will be hindered by the progression, which will inflict nasty side effects. Everbright. Welcome to the frosty dimension. Firstly, I want to look at the different biomes we have. The biggest I experience are snow-covered pines, with starlight trees make them into these blocks, or a starter tool set. This one is more powerful than the right in this world. The most common creature you will find here is the Stardust Ram. It's the Everbright sheep variant. You can shear them and upon death they drop mutton. Another passive mob is the reindeer. It's tameable, but we don't have access to the food at the moment. They drop venison, which can be cooked. Azulfus are the bigger brothers of reindeers, kinda. These come in hordes, and if you attack one of them, all of them will be angry. Occasionally, they can drop their horn that can be converted into bone meal. And their meat, which can be cooked, but venison is better. The best way how to hunt them is with spears. More about them later. Now to some aggressive entities. One of the first is the Armored Frost Spirit. This time not even a sword will help you, but you need to attack with a pig. After they died, their soul will be set free, summoning a Frost Spirit, which won't attack you anymore. If you still manage to attack these ghosts, they can drop Star Flayers and Soul Fragments. By the way, this mod doesn't add any torches, but you can place down Star Flayers. A more rarer frozen animal is the Crinocerus. It has more range, but again vulnerable to pickaxes, and will again be freed into a spirit. The Polar Geist is a hostile mob resembling a white bear. It's quite fast and will stand on its feet to attack. And even a saber-toothed tiger called Diaphyd Prolus, these will circle their prey to only jump at them. It's easier to fight them when you try to escape. You can dodge their attacks by walking in the other direction. They can drop a raw municipal monkfish, another new food source. One of the few foliage plants found here are the blueberry bushes. You can harvest them. If planted on mycelium, they will grant you blackberries to cure poison. Plant these bushes on farmland instead to get more berries at once. Another biome are the bright lands, a bleak landscape with some starlight trees and logs on the ground. Then the brisk meadow, a flourishing biome with brisk blues that emit particles. A new tree type, the blue bright tree, can be found here occasionally as tiny trees. It seems like Azulfus love to assemble here. The calming skies is a mountainous variant of the prior one, without flowers but you can find both tree types. The frostbitten forest consists out of blue bright and the new frost bright tree. Similar to our smaller jungle, here you can even encounter a new mob, the snow owl. These can be heard from a very long distance, making this biome even more mysterious. They live atop of the trees. Our sub biome is the frostbitten forest clearing. Quite the same as a mega tiger biome is the polar highland, but without the big trees. Clusters of icy cobblestone surface on the ground. 
The slush lands can be divided into two biomes, the wet subbiome and the forest. The lake-filled subbiome contains big snow-capped mushrooms and chilled lily pads floating on water. These bigger mushrooms eat heat around it. It can be used to craft the snow-capped furnace, which uses heat inside of items to regenerate heat. Occasionally, some products will leave ingredients behind. Magma cream slime ball, jack o lanterns calf pumpkins, lanterns iron nuggets, magma block netherrack, fire camp logs, water ice and lava obsidian. A new hostile mob found here is the Shrumpy. These small mushroom devils will try to camouflage as snow-capped mushrooms to only sneak up on you. Upon hitting you, they will laugh manically. This is the only biom that has large grass. Break it to obtain pinecone seeds. These can grow pinecone and reindeers love pinecones. You can tame them with it and have a new mount. And you can even breed Azulfus with it. The midday shore is the optimal biome before we start with ocean ones. Here you can find midnight sand made into these blocks. A new host come up found here is the whistle shell crab. It survives in and outside of the water. On land it's really fast but has low range. In water it can dash to you but really isn't that big of a challenge. The Peking Ocean is the first ocean biome we will be looking at. It comes in the normal and deep variant. First you can find here whistle shell crabs. But not only that, a ton of living beings are home to the ocean like the jelly drifter, the monk fish, some vanilla fish and the griddle flatfish. These are very strange as they are easy to scare. An attempt to be brave will try to hurt you to just swim away. But they are a very good food source which you can cook. Lastly, you can encounter a giant clam creature, this sea clam. It appears that as soon as you come too near it, it will shut its mouth, protecting the pearl it contains. Acquire it by punching it a bit and right click once its mouth is open to get the pearl, but be aware that it doesn't crush you. These plants found throughout the whole oceans are called brumble and can be made into these blocks. There's also a sub biome, the brumble forest, which has way more brumble. Before moving to caverns, just a quick side note, you can get winter leaf seeds out of normal grass, which can be harvested for winter leaf, a new food source. Caverns. These caverns are quite dark, similar to a brightness effect, so don't try to go mining with just brightness to 100%. Firstly, there are two different stone blocks, tritite and rimstone, both made into these blocks. The most common ore is moonstone. Acquire with only wood pick. You can make a pressure plate and a block out of it. Third use is for spears. These can be made with any wood type and are like spiky tridents. These can be enchanted with piercing and loyalty and even work underwater. In both dimensions you can find pile rope. It's a red gem made into armor and tools. It's weaker than iron. Pile rope is a very light material allowing you to use its tools very quickly but with low durability. Aquite is a blue water gem. Its strength is the same as iron, but has more enchantability. Again, in both dimensions. The upside is a heavy green material for armor and tools. Even though it comes with more durability, it's way slower, but also more damaging. This can also be found in both dimensions. Charoid is the same strength as diamond. Again, found in both dimensions, but it's a bit weaker than diopside. In exchange of that, you can use it faster. Venchium is the equivalent to iron but without tools and armor. Its purpose is to make shears, buckets and the toolbox. With that specific bucket you can as well capture almost all ocean entities. It can only be found here or use it instead of iron. Fossa can only be found in Everbright. Firstly you can make the warding pearl out of it. A lantern-like light source crafted with soul fragments and a pearl. This prevents hostiles to spawn within a large radius. This is very helpful as light sources don't prevent hostiles from spawning. Another use is with the toolbox. Full sight can be added to any tool from Everbright or Everdawn, adding a temporary 40 extra durability on top. This can be redone indefinitely. Structures Dungeon This is a small structure indicated by an entrance on top. It's the way to four closed rooms filled with armored frost spirits. It's a great way to replenish on star flares, random enchanted books and food like cryo root. Summoner's Dungeon This is called the Blinding Dungeon. It's a massive tower consisting out of four smaller side towers. In these you can find keys for the Blinding Dungeon. In case you don't have all of them, you can buy keys after interacting with the dungeon entrance from the gatekeeper. The smaller towers can be with or without chests. The library maze, sometimes you need to interact with the lever to find the chest. The Vindicator Room and the Grand Bedroom. 
Now to the boss fight. Summer summons two different minions. Both of them are artificial golems. One shoot and the other melee attack you. The boss itself will teleport away from you, shoot a purple beam and sometimes summon a lightning strike that generates flames which will inflict levitation. After he lost half of his health, he will summon angry minions. He can as well sometimes regenerate health. Upon death, he will drop his trophy and his loot bag. Depending on the rarity of the loot bag, you can find some of these five artifacts in there. Firstly, the ethereal arc will boost your movement speed by either 15 or 20 amount of percent. That depends on the rarity. Right click it to equip it. Open your inventory and select the second GOI to see what arcs you have equipped. Only one per type can be equipped. This is also the way how to resummon the boss. The soul bone spear is like a spear with loyalty, it will come back to you. And now to the spell tome and the summoning table. Use the book in the table with soul fragments to change what the book can do. The fluctuant sphere, the purple beam, that deals a bit of damage, or you can summon your own loyal minion that will defend you. Nature's Dungeon. Now to the last dungeon in this dimension, the Nature's Dungeon. It consists out of four layers. Each room has a few spawners that will summon stone lads. Apparently pickaxes make more damage. I suggest you grab Starlight's saplings and the Nature Stone while scavenging for loot, as these can be exchanged with the gatekeeper for nature keys, in case you can't find all of them naturally generated in chests. Now to the boss fight. In the middle you have the Starlight Crusher. He can summon hostile wooden snow owls and sputers, big mushrooms that will spit out seeds. The way how to defeat them is to chop down one of his walls with an axe and then stun him with a spear, preferably soul bone spear. Then you can start attacking him with an axe. It has to be an axe by the way. No other tool will harm him. Before talking about the drops, his attacks can be slamming into the ground, spinning while shooting roots, summoning roots around him or in the direction you are standing. Apart from your trophies, you can as well get out of the loot bag three unique drops, a music disc, the arc and the hammer. The arc this time can increase your health depending on your rarity. The crushing hammer slams into the ground to hurt surrounding mobs and sends them flying. Before continuing with the next dimension, on top of the dungeon cherry trees grow. You can also find their saplings as loot. Firstly, if blueberries are planted on cherry grass, they will grant regen 3 upon consuming. And you can craft these blocks out of trees. But their leaves as well drop cherries. You can craft a cherry pie out of them. Villagers! And before starting with Everdawn, this mod as well adds custom villagers in their dimensions. With that as well new workstations and jobs. Firstly, you get the trough. This isn't only a workstation, if baby animals are near it, they have a chance to eat from it, which will speed up their growth. It can be refilled with any vegetable. The villager crates is the Wrangler. It sells food and related items or animal drops. The next one is the already known toolbox. It creates the shoveler. He will sell by ores from this dimension, as will create shovels with or without a chance. One of the summoner boss drops, the summoning table, is as well a workstation. It creates the summoner. It can trade for mob drops, but even sell drops like the summoning tome. Lastly, we have a new block, the star emitter. With it, you will acquire the stargazer villager. It trades for ores and moon shards. But with it, you can acquire two new items. The moonstone lantern, which is a new light source, and the astrolope. It allows you to link it to a star emitter and then be able to teleport to it at a cooldown cost. This only works within a small distance though. Everdon, welcome to Everdon, the poisonous darker brother of Everbright. Firstly the biomes, within the shared woodlands you will find a new desk tree made into these blocks. This forest is home to some new mobs, like the firefly or the cosmic fox. He drops fox pelt. With it, you can make the bag of spoils. It's like a sugar box being able to hold only 5 stacks though. Place it down with a shift click. But that isn't all. It acts as a workstation for the Night Watcher. It trades various random deals for emeralds as well even the bag of spoils. But this villager is quite different. Instead of going to sleep, he will be awake and steal from other villagers. The bag of spoils can even be used to steal from other villagers by sneak clicking on them while they aren't looking. If they catch you though, the trades will go up. The fox belt can also be used to make the camel settle. More about it later. Now to some more mobs, quite similar to Azophos, but the shade monitor can even adapt to its surrounding, changing their texture. They can drop monitor tails that can be cooked, and can even be bred with any meat or fish. 
The next saucer in this dimension is the Nyctofly, resembling a dark dragonfly, they love heavily wooded areas. These insects can spot you from far away thanks to their eyes. They can drop slime balls and bug guts. More common hostiles are the venom spiders. This one likes you so much it will even spit at you. Isn't that gorgeous? If you keep your distance, but if you come too close, it will attack with its venomous bite. Normal spider drops and bug guts. Before moving on, if you break grass, you can get two new seeds, the furry bean and scale fruits. Both of these can be planted as well harvested. These are a good starting food source. The next plant is the crescent orchard. These trees here can be used to harvest crescent fruits. You can eat them, but a way more cooler use is if you feed it to a cosmic fox, as he will be tamed, even following your orders, making him sit or follow you. This biome features foxes, shade monitors. A sub-biome of it is the Crescent Orchard Lake. The Moonlit Reservoir is a more of a dismal biome, with bunches of trees scattered throughout the landscape. The new mob found here is the Krogra. Insects of Everdawn hate this entity and will flee as soon as it comes to close. These can be tamed with bug guts and will even follow you if you hold it. After tamed, you can sell them, allowing fast transport through the landscape and even in water. Welcome to the Crystal Dunes. These spikes are made out of raw moonstone, which can only be acquired here. They are used to make the moonstone shield. The sand can be made into these blocks. If you bone meal these crystal flowers, you can acquire the crystallized trees crafted into these blocks. Next to the venom spiders, you will encounter here one of the more dangerous hostiles. The Amberback, a giant fire beetle. Not only that these will shoot fire at you, but if you are far away, they will come buzzing at you. These insects have such a big brain that they will even detect if you consumed a fire resistance potion instead attacking you by biting. They drop bug guts, but if you lure them into water, they drown, so maybe not so smart. Another new mob in this biome are the crystal camels. If fed scale fruits, they can be tamed. Even though not the fastest, they can be mounted with a camel cell and you can even add a chest on their back for extra storage. If you happen to be here while it's normally raining in the other biomes, you will experience a sandstorm instead. A sub-biome of the crystal dunes are the crystal dune spikes with more moonstone spikes. The next is a biome is the crystal roughs with some lunar trees. Occasionally you can find here crystallized trees. Here are mob spawns that you would normally only encounter underground, the infested swarmer. These aren't that big of a challenge, but are quite speedy. They drop bug guts. The next biome is the Serum Grassland. Decorated with patches of lunar cobblestone, which can be made into these blocks by the way, and some maple trees crafted into these building blocks. Fire beetles are native here, as well as a new mob called Sliv. Resembling a small snake, this is just a passive mob, nothing more. And right next to the following biome, the maple forest with maple trees. Lastly, we've got the unorthodox valley with some crescent fruit and lunar trees. This biome is especially unique by soaring into heights with its mountains. Actually, there is one more biome, but it's only part of a river called Rising Creek. You can identify it by the cool stood on the sides of or within a river or lake. If we are already talking about the sea, just a quick note about the fish in this dimension. Next to vanilla ones, you can encounter the char scale moki and the horizofin tunid. Both of them can be cooked. Caverns. Again, these are very dark, so no brightness can help you. Apart from the already known ores, pyrope, aquite, charite, and diopside, there's only one new ore, horizonite. All of the tools have the ability to auto smelt ores or set opponents on fire. As comparison, it's weaker than iron. This ore can only be found underground under crystal dunes. With it, you can even craft a new furnace, the Horizonite Forge. It allows you to smelt ores without any fuel. Well, almost. It comes with a recharge cost. This can be recharged with anything that's made out of Horizonite. Or use the less expensive strategy and find some sandstone crystals. These can be used as normal fuel or in the forge. They can only be acquired in sunset maple forests or searing grasslands. And lastly, you can find two new decorative blocks within the deepest parts of this dimension. Cinder stone, a mixture between lava, magma and cobble, crafted into these blocks, and the darkish umber. And of course, you can find once again here moonstone in ore or crystal variant, and some hostas such as the fire beetle, but most commonly the infested swarmer. Dungeon Alchemist 
this building is quite similar to the Summoner's Tower, having four side towers with the Evoker Room, the Grand Bedroom, the Witch's Lab and the Mini Maze Library. The key to this bottle spell is the same as of the Weatherbright Blinding Dungeon, meaning you don't need to interact with the lock to be able to buy the key from the gatekeeper. Now to the boss spell itself. Most of the fighting the alchemist does himself. He will teleport away as soon as you approach him, but during spell casting he cannot do that, meaning it's time to strike. Firstly, he can summon spikes above your head that will slam down, piercing through armor. They are easy to dodge though. If you approach him while well, he does this spike attack, the spikes will face upwards and will surround him. Another way he attacks is to use arrow bundles. Occasionally these can even be fire arrows. This can be nullified by using the water in the room, but the alchemist can convert that into lava temporarily. And lastly he can as well blind you for a few seconds, and of course he can heal himself when he's weak. Depending on the difficulty you choose, you will get a trophy. And of course you can uh, as well resummon him with the arc you get out of the loot bag. So let's start to talk about the loot bag itself. Next to enchanted books and ores you can acquire 4 artifacts, excluding again the blinding dungeon music disc. Then we have the arc called Dusk Arc. With it you can go invis if you sneak. The different tiers change if you are as well surrounded by smoke while using this ability, allowing you to be more or less incognito. Either it can be common with smoke, uncommon with reduced smoke or rare with no smoke. The next item is the spike shield. Not only that this one has double durability of a normal shield, but you can as well use it to attack. Now to the alchemy table. This one can convert blocks to either the old world variant or of the opposite dimension, which is very handy. If stone of one dimension is combined with an arc, you can even get the uncraftable dungeon blocks, such as from the nature dungeon. But that's not all, it can even act as a new workstation for the alchemist. He sells alchemy related stuff and buckets and even the next item the alchemy scroll. Lastly the alchemy scroll. This is only allows you to mimic the falling spikes from the alchemist boss battle. If you look in a particular direction and hold the scroll you can summon the falling spikes. If you sneak while doing so the upward spikes will be summoned. Poison dungeon. And now to the last boss of this showcase. And welcome to the poison dungeon. To find this you have to look out for a dead tree covered in cobwebs. That tree is actually hollow, allowing you access to the last dungeon. Welcome to the underground maze. Here you can find cave spiders, venom spiders, spawners. The dungeon itself consists out of four levels until you find a staircase to a very special corridor filled with pillars. At the end of it you will meet your final boss. Of course again you can buy the keys from the gatekeeper in exchange of poison stone and spider eyes. This time I used night vision and some torches during the boss battles so you can see better what's going on. Also if you are scared of spiders, please skip this part. Welcome to the scary arachnic boss battle. This enormous spider is probably the most difficult one to defeat. While a hissing sound is being played, the spider will collect energy to launch at the player inflicting damage. Sometimes during this attack it can resolve into the player being held captive by the boss, which will then munch on it without any mercy. To break free, deal out damage. The next attack is when it jumps on the ceiling, spitting venom at you. After losing enough health, this attack evolves into being able to generate poison clouds on the ground and also following you while seemingly pooping out poisonous spit. Lastly, it can summon its baby that hide in the spider nests all around the boss area, which gives it enough time to prepare the next attack. But at least you can temporarily stun it if it rams into a shield during the launch attack, which gives you time to strike but disabling your shield in exchange. Now to the loot. Like always you will be rewarded with a trophy depending on the difficulty. Now let's start talking about the loot bag in general. You can find up to 4 different artifacts in this one, including a music disc. Firstly the weapon called Venom Sack. Hold it to fire a poisonous venom ball. Now to the arc, the poisonous one. This increases depending on its tier your damage when poisoned. The highest one would be increased damage by 3. And this arc is as well used to resummon the boss. And lastly the different swords. This one is a rather weird weapon. Even though it deals out enormous amount of damage, it will regen the opponent. If so, if you are a fast attacker, then you will probably love this weapon. Remaining features. Lastly, of course, he has well spawned villages in the variant of the Everdawn though. And the last item we have left is the food preparation table. This one is a very unique way how to prepare food. Minimum of 3, maximum of 5 ingredients. It's used to mix different nutrients together to create better food items. 
Firstly, the food you use increases the saturation of the prepared food dish, meaning the most beneficial is to use meat. By adding different flour types, it acts as some sort of seasoning, which can have different effects. So let's start with all flowers effect. Everdon, Moonlit Bloom, Night Vision, Crystal Flower, Invisibility, Blaze Bud, Fire Resistance, Flare Floray, Hunger, Night Crest, Bad Omen or well, Raid, Mugweed, Mining Fatigue, Lutes and Root, Bad Luck. Everbright, Blush Blossom, Region, Brisk Bloom, Luck, Brittle Bush, Weakness, Chillweed, Slow Falling, Polar Posy, Mining Fatigue, Snow Bloom, Slowness, Camellia, Speed, Midday, Bay Hop, Conduct Powder, and Froze. Blindness. Adding a sauce is possible with potions, which will add the potion effect on top of your food. But this can only be done with one potion. You can add blueberries to enhance the potency and duration of a potion effect. That was today's full mod showcase. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please leave a like or maybe consider to subscribe. And please check out my gaming channel. I'm trying to get it to 5k. And I'm really, really try hard there. Like, when we got back, I fortified our base so zombies can't slam down our doors anymore. FBI, I'm over editing everything. So, thank you, and we'll see us in the next video. Ciao!